Do you have some difficult people in your life? Well, today's show is for you. If you'd like to know how to deal with difficult people, I've got a guest on the show that's going to help us out. Welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. I am your host, Willa White, and this is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. It also goes out on the Willowdale Assembly Facebook page, as well as my YouTube channel. It gets uploaded there later on. And so you're welcome to watch it when we go live, or you can catch the replay and watch in your own time and binge watch the shows. You've got this is year seven of my show. So you've got all of those years of shows that you can go back and you can type in your favorite guest's name and watch more of the shows that they've done with me or a particular topic and really explore that to your heart's content. And on my podcast show, I typically focus on uh, topics relating to spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, and more. So I encourage you to tune in and enjoy. And I'm welcoming back onto my show today, Colleen Vanderzeit. Hello, Colleen. Hello, how are you? Good, good. I'm glad you're back with us again. And for those of you who don't know who Colleen Vanderzeiden is, she is a registered Lily Dale medium. She's also one of the Lily Dale radio show hosts. You've probably ca caught her, her show on Tuesday evenings. And uh, you can definitely check out some of her past shows, right? Oh yeah, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I know you do a lot with the life coaching work and uh, that it's exciting that we've been registered mediums for as long as we have. And I remember sitting in circle with you many decades ago and it's just been fun to watch us both grow in the ways that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I know I want to have a few announcements real quickly uh, because I, I just forgot I need to make reference to the fact that Lilydale is planning some events for the solar eclipse that's happening or we're, we're going to get totality here folks so uh, they are planning a lot of events for April 6th through 8th and the 8th is the actual eclipse date and you can find more information about that on the lilydaleassembly.org website as well as the other zoom class offerings that they do and the summer season program for 2024 is available for you to go ahead and register for classes, look at the whole program guide of those things. We get some great uh, presenters that come in throughout the summer and uh, you can go ahead and register for classes. Definitely get booked for your lodging if you know that you're going to need to stay overnight. We've got guest houses and hotels. I think that's almost full, actually, is what I had heard. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's <laughs> booking in really fast. And you all also get booked in with the, the medium of your choice. And you can find that list also on the lilydaleassembly.org website. And I know, Colleen, you have some uh, workshops that you'll be teaching for the summer. Do you want to tell them real quick? Sure. I'm going to do a platform mediumship workshop in July, help people, uh, you know, be a little more effective maybe <laughs> with what they're doing and more evidence coming in. I'm going to do a workshop called the courageous empath and just help, help people handle their empathic abilities and not get so caught up in their sensitivities. And yeah. then another one called finding the real you. So those will be fun. Yeah, those will be great. Absolutely. So yes, a lot of great things that are happening for the summer season. I hope you'll, you'll be able to join us and uh, get excited, not just about Colleen's shows uh, and, and workshops, but about all of the great things that are happening in Lily Dell this year. And so without further ado, we're going to jump into our topic, which is how to deal with difficult people. <laughs> Notice <laughs> the way I said it, because that's how most people think about difficult people. <laughs> oh, yes. Do, do we need to define difficult people first? Oh. Yeah, it's those people that, well, you know, where our whole body goes, ah, <laughs> and, you know, and it is so interesting because with difficult people, it's so frequently it's people who are important in our lives. And so how do we handle those and not go insane? <laughs> <laughs> So this will be a very interesting show where some of it will be tongue in cheek <laughs> and some of it will, will give you some tips to actually apply in your life so that you can work through some of the issues that you have with people. And um, I, I think it's really good, especially since 
there's so many empaths that that watch this show and so they tend to be even more sensitive to a lot of the things that go on and and uh in their families and their friendships and their work environments and in the world uh, but yes let's jump right into it colleen absolutely you know it's so interesting because when we think about difficult people we get so caught up in our own emotions with them, right? We feel like we have to defend ourselves sometimes, you know, if we're getting criticized or attacked. Sometimes we just feel wronged, you know, it, it can be very stressful because people don't change. They don't act the way we want them to or expect them to. And it's really hard when we have those kinds of people in our lives and everybody has them. It's not like, you know, this is a special thing. Everybody has them, you know? <laughs> Is everybody has a difficult person in their life that they're needing to um, move past or find acceptance about. And, and so I think this is a topic that's going to hit, a, hit for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think sometimes, too, when we're handling difficult people, we feel like we don't have the ability or the power to change how we're looking at things. It's like, well, we can't. That's, you know, I can't I can't change them. So I'm going to be miserable forever. It's like. Okay, but maybe you could go in a different direction and not be miserable forever, you know, and it is it is I'm a big uh, believer in everything that happens in my life is there to help me on my spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And people, they are great teachers to help us on our spiritual path. Absolutely. They, they are the the educators, the great educators, because it's ultimately not about what happens to us, it's how we react to it that dictates the event. And as you say, it's the, the whole universe is conspiring for our greater good. And it's sometimes hard to see that. Yes. <laughs> this isn't what I ordered for Christmas, as it were. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's, it is, and we're also sometimes dealing with, you know, our own expectations, because uh, I, in some of my coaching groups more recently, people have said they didn't, ex they didn't act the way I expected them to, or I would never have done that. And so we have those underlying beliefs that people should behave a certain way, or that if I would act like this, how can somebody else not do the same thing? Right. The golden rule, treat people as, you know, treat others as you would have them treat you, you know, that kind of thing. And you're thinking, well, you know, I feel offended. You know, people can get into these these uh, thought forms, but uh, there's training involved with the people that are in your life and, and uh, how you would like them to treat you. Yeah, absolutely. And the empaths, we, we tend to have a, st a struggle with uh, boundaries. Um, and I always say, you can set your boundary after the fact. It's okay. Um, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, right. I mean, it is so interesting as, and especially too, and maybe this could be part of it. As we come into our spirituality, our, our power, our personal power, and we want to live differently, maybe. We want to be happier. And then where maybe before we tolerated behaviors, now mm. we're going, you know what? I don't like this anymore. And I want them to be different. And so I have to stand up for myself. And then when I do stand up for myself, then they're mad at me because now I have threatened the status quo. And then because they're threatened, now I'm in my empathic people pleasing. Oh, no, I've made a change. I've ruined our relationship. And then I back down. And then I'm out of my power again. And so, so interesting, particularly these days, because so many women particularly <laughs> are waking up and recognizing, wait a minute, this person, there's, there's got to be a different way to handle them. You know, and so then they try and they try to speak up, but then they get pushed back at and they don't know what to do. So what do we do right with that situation? How do we handle that when we've we've spoken up? They're not changing. That's always the big thing. They're not changing. And that's when we go, OK, let's talk about that in a sec. But it's, they're not changing. But it's so important to believe in some, themselves enough to go, you know what? This is important to me. This is 
I, this is no longer acceptable. Yes, it was acceptable yesterday. Yes, it was acceptable for the last 20 years, but now it is no longer acceptable. And to be able to stand in that power and go, I have to do this for me. And then that brings up the whole feelings of selfishness. I mean, there's just like this web of stuff out there. Yes. And, and women, men too, but women, um, because I can speak from, from that vantage point, <laughs> you know, you have that combination of uh, the people pleasing, like you said, and then as you arc through life, you know, wanting to please your, your mate and wanting to please the people you work with and, and then, you know, wanting to, to help your children that mo the mother guilt can be so strong, right? Yes. Of, of wanting to do those, wanting to, um, you're supposed to be uh, selfless as a parent, right? You're, you're supposed to be, it is very much a, an aspect that like you signed up to, to be there for this, this baby, this growing child, this teenager and into adulthood and the parenthood parenting never stops with those things. And then grandparents, like all the stuff that, that uh, evolves and also wanting to be there for friends. So there's the, the balancing act that's constantly evolving in people. Mm -hmm. And there, I, I think what happens is that uh, it's like a powder keg right? Let's say they've been stop, stopping it back down in. Like so, and it's usually, uh, metaphysically speaking, gone somewhere in their body too, right? They've yeah. stuffed it. You, you've probably noticed this within yourself and other people. They stuff it somewhere. And then they end up having some sort of physical thing that erupts in that zone um, that leap, leap, leaps at them a lot. And they just, oh, yeah, I got to ignore this. I got to ignore this. And then it, it all just sort of culminates and and then the Pompeii happens is what I call it. <laughs> right. People may die. <laughs> <laughs> cue, cue the doom music on this. And then you're the bad, bad guy because you, you have been persisting, as you said. So just to give it a little dramatic flair. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sequence yeah. people through that. But so there has to be a, a an understanding of getting yourself under control again but at the same time finding healthy ways to cope with things and to speak with things and i i think that it's helpful if you have another person who can be a, a balancer for you in that i think it's it's hard to go it alone through through uh, those things because sometimes a lot of the the big uh, buzz for a person is that they have felt alone right yep so it's good if you can partner with somebody maybe a life coach or maybe a therapist or counselor of some some kind that you know, can help see you through so that can maybe give you the words and and some of the energetic structure uh, of understanding that you need to proceed with things absolutely you know, last night on my show, I talked about living as our soul, basically, and what that meant, you know, being in the love and the light and how you express that love and light into the world. So if we're with, uh, have to uh, be with some difficult people, you know, and so many people, and I'm going to digress for a second. So many people think the way to handle difficult people is to stop talking to them or leave. And certainly, yes, in cases of abuse, et cetera, they're their uh, separation is necessary. Absolutely. But this should not be our first choice. Right. And right. Go. And particularly so many times the difficult people are our colleagues, our boss, our family members, our good friends, even, you know? And so if we look at the situation from the love of our soul, what is the best solution, the best way to show love in a situation with somebody who's difficult, you know, which doesn't mean unconditional love gone wrong, where we, we accept everything about them and put up with abuse. That doesn't mean that. But what is the best way to show the love, not only toward them, but toward ourselves as well? Oh, I'm interested. I have, I have an answer, but I want to hear yours. It's, it's so cool. Um, I'm very big about people learning who they are and learning their power and living from that truth. That is my message that I will do until I die and beyond. Um, but 
if I'm going to live from my love and my light, I want to choose a higher response, a higher vibrational response. So let's just say you have a family member. Let's pick a sister <laughs> just to label and make it easier. We have a sister who is difficult, you know, um, is a, has narcissistic tendencies, for example. And if most people that I'm meeting these days are empaths, it's crazy how many more people are empaths. If you are an empath, you will have a narcissistic person in your life somewhere. It's a law. So you've got, <laughs> you've got to, I know, right? You've got a <laughs> narcissistic sister. Everything is all about her. She's in the victim mode all the time. She gets mad at you because of something she thinks you did. And that was not what you did, or her perception is just totally wrong. So now how do we handle that? Right? How do we handle a narcissistic family member where you love her, you still want to have connection with her, you want to have her in your family, you're, you're not at the point of cutting her out or anything like that. So if we're in our love, to show that love might be that we recognize Number one, that's just who she is. That's just who she is. And every time we get set, upset about it, we get triggered. We're allowing ourselves to get triggered. If she's the way she is, why are, why are we flipping out? That's the way she's going to be. So we look at her and go, well, that's the way she is. And we're done. You know, so I, I tell it's people. Like you get to a place where you just shrug your shoulders and go, okay, it's just, it's, it's like, um, I love the story of uh, from Carlos Castaneda when he's um, talking to Don Don Juan or Don Duan, depending on how you want to say it. But he's explaining about how he uh, is out in the the wilds and he's being stalked by a jaguar. You know that part of the story, and yeah. he's stalked by the jaguar for three days, and he's you know he's gotten back to the mentor and he's telling him the whole thing. It's very dramatic, and. He says, I was just so terrified all the time. I went, oh, I'm just constant, the barrage of feeling hunted. And at any moment I could die. Serious stuff, right? And what does his mentor say? Well, at any point were you offended by the Jaguar? <laughs> and, he, and Carlos says, no, of course not. Why? Well, because he's just being a Jaguar. He's just being who it who it is you know it's just being who it is and his mentor says then why would you get offended if other people are just being who they are so uh, isn't that such a great like wow sometimes you you have jaguars in your life and you think that you're going to be torn asunder at any second and if you are in that space of being offended about it or being in a in a space of trigger you're actually heightening the experience for yourself in a wrong way yeah absolutely and it's it's wonderful though because we can learn from that yeah. so if we have that emotional trigger you know like every time your sister is flipping out about something what happens mm -hmm. is it's reflecting some kind of belief within ourselves that we're not good enough and so it's like, well, she's not listening to me. How come she's not listening to me? Why is she so mean to me? And so there, we get stuck in these emotions where we feel attacked. And, and yes, she may very well be attacking us, but we, that doesn't mean we have to accept it. And if that's, we know that's the way she is, we can step back and we can also use it to learn and go and recognize, okay, these emotions are telling me I'm getting triggered. I'm getting triggered because I'm interpreting her behaviors in some way that is making it about me not being good enough. I'm taking something personally that it may be personal on her part, but I don't have to take it that way. Well, I think that another aspect of this, especially speaking to sensitives and empaths, because a lot of them watch the show. And uh, what happens is when somebody's angry, you feel it. You feel shaken uh -huh. to the core. It, it like it reverberates through you more than a normal person, shall we say. <laughs> and it can sometimes live in you that day, weeks, or sometimes years later. And you just feel that and you want it to stop. It's like when people talk too loud and they won't be quiet. And, you know, you just want to do, 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 do. And so then you almost want to lash out to make it stop. Absolutely. Oh, we've got it. We want this to be done with. But 
if you give in to any of that shrinking behavior or you give in to the lash out, they almost want that lash out because then they can see, see, <laughs> like I poked the bear enough. I got the response. And sometimes I think they get um, like juice from it, you know? Oh, yeah. They get, um, they were waiting for that, that friction so that they could have the, um, and the energy from the friction. Absolutely. So if you could see it that way, you can say, okay, I'm not going to feed into the friction on this. Mm -hmm. It's game over. Yeah, that and it helps so much. Yeah. Oh, I have a family member who who likes to push the buttons. And, you know, I'm good for a while, but sometimes it's like, oh, you know, boom, and I give it back. And then I'm like, ah, darn, I lost it. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's back to my thing of the more you know yourself, the more you understand yourself and you recognize, oh, this is just being triggered because of this self-belief then you can heal that part. And then when you're really, really in that amazing space, when you get that energy coming at you, it's almost like your energy is so strong. It doesn't affect you as much. You know, I, I tell people in my empath class that, I mean, like I am a major empath. I can't even watch a Disney movie without stopping it five times because somebody does something unethical or something wrong happens or somebody dies. I mean, like, I have to know what's going to happen. I just can't. I'm so sensitive. And if something went wrong and somebody, you know, mistook how I said something or, or I did do something right. And now I'd hurt somebody's feelings or something. And then you're overthinking it and overanalyzing it. I would be up for five nights in a row worrying about this. And that's how sensitive I, I used to be. I'm still very sensitive, but at least it's under control now. And now if something happens, I can usually get through it so much faster. Thank goodness. And part of it's just because of what we're talking about, you know, recognizing, you know, they are the way they are. One thing that really helped me too, um, a few years ago is when I heard about personality disorders, I hadn't, you know, it's back to that. I would never do this. Why would they do that idea? Right. Right. But when I heard about personality disorders, um, I was like, wait a minute, they really do have a, an issue and they cannot be like me. And it was just so eye-opening to me. Because you were able to give grace more, in it more so than yes. usual. Because you're like, okay, this is this is, is something that on one level they can't help. Yeah, it made such a huge difference because it made it so much easier for me to accept that people are the way they are, because I could see then it was more factual in my mind, I guess I could see they really, no matter how hard they try, if, I mean, whether it's legitimate trying is another question, but no matter how hard they try, um, it's not going to, they're not going to change. And then it was so much easier to go, oh, I get it, you know, and to recognize that can really help. It really can. Yeah. I think that's a, a valid point for sure. It, it it will help you to change your reaction to what's going on. Yeah. And another thing to do too, related pops into my head um, is I like to change the interpretation of things. So say somebody is, and I always use this example, I'm in the grocery store, or whatever, and the, the cashier person is impatient and short with me are initial automatic response is why is she treating me like this and we immediately in our minds get defensive and she and then it turns into she doesn't like me and this is where if we're not careful and not intentional we are going to give her back that same energy but if we want to live from our light we've got to pause stop and go wait a minute And so I like to reinterpret, why is she acting like this? Maybe she's just having a crappy day. Sometimes I'll do a crazy story. You know, she was abducted by aliens and she never learned how to be nice to people or doesn't even know what people are like. And see, and that gets me laughing, which breaks me out of my, oh, what's wrong with this? And then I can go into more serious possible things. Maybe she had a 
bad result on a medical test. Maybe her son's been out all night and she hasn't, and he hasn't come home and she's really worried about him, you know? Mm -hmm. So once I, I be intentional in my interpretation of their motivation, if you will, it's so much easier for me to step back and not be caught in my emotions. So difficult people, it's kind of the same thing. Why are they like that? Being curious. They're fighting a battle. They're fighting a battle. Right. Everybody is in some way, shape or form. But I I think it's important to have that that level of compassionate detachment. Okay. Yeah. The detachment helps you to not be in the triggered state, but the compassion lets you to just see wherever they're at on things, understand that that's all they can handle at that particular moment, give a little grace without enabling bad behavior. Yeah. It's, it's tricky, you know, because when you, when you think, well, I must exhibit unconditional love to my family, to my friends, uh, all the people in my circle, and even the cashier, right? But that doesn't mean that you enable bad behavior or get walked on per se. But I think it does help as you said, put, kind of put yourself in, in their shoes, uh, look at what their life story might be happening in happening right now, what's happening for them. That's uh, triggering. Again, we're going to say that we're a lot probably. <laughs> right. And, you know, and part of the problem with handling these difficult people is we want to feel better, mm -hmm. you know, now sometimes we want to prove them wrong, which is if we recognize that that's, where what we're doing that's a whole other issue we need to look at that's a whole different show that's a whole <laughs> other thing i mean if we want to prove somebody wrong that's that's vengeful that is not coming from the love and the light and we don't want to get stuck in those emotions so we just want to feel better and so some of these ideas can help people go okay i do feel better and this doesn't mean though and and it's important to acknowledge that we don't have the right to be upset. Oh, that's an interesting thought. We don't okay. have the right to be upset. You have a right to be upset. If somebody is mean to you, even if that's just the way they are, mm -hmm. you have a right to have an emotional reaction and be and be irritated and be sad. You have that right and you need to express it. So I'm not saying, and I, I say this a lot too, do not skip your emotional reaction. Right. So we have, you have that right to feel it, but if you're getting stuck there and you keep telling yourself the story about how this person did me wrong, blah, 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 blah. Now you're stuck. Now you need to step back. And once you step back from the emotions, then you can process them more healthfully. Yes. And I, th I think uh, uh, to sum that up, it would be, there's a difference between venting and complaining. Yes. Complaining <laughs> takes on a habitual role in a life and keeps them in a victim mode of almost like, hey, look what I've been through. Um, but venting is very much a, a venting clears the air and it is done. And there's not this revisiting that has to keep going at like the picking of the scab and oh, look, it's bleeding again because I just picked this gap. So I mean, th there's a different kind of healing that's needed for different things that are going on within a person and I think when we see these other behaviors in in folks uh, it behooves us to say well in what way have we maybe been showing up in that way like how how have we been complaining about an aspect of our life or another person and you know the universe is definitely watching <laughs> they they will bring that to our attention by uh, having these other people we rub up against with, uh, against wrong, you know, uncomfortable way. Oh yeah. I call that reflection in my book, um, yeah. where if somebody is, if we're bothered by somebody's behavior, one of the things we need to do is look at ourselves and see if that is what we're doing. You know, years ago, um, I was an amazing complainer. I'm so much better now, but I didn't recognize it at the time because it was just a coping mechanism and I didn't know. And then after I woke up spiritually, I you know, started to recognize some different things. And then one day I caught myself complaining about a colleague at work and all of his complaining. So he would come into my office, shut the door. My whole planning period would be gone listening to him complaining. Right. And so then I was talking to somebody else. I said, oh, my God, he complains all the time. It's like endless. Da, 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 da. And finally, it popped into my head. Uh, do you hear yourself? 
that you are complaining about his complaining, which was kind of ironic and fun. Um, and yeah. then, right, after that, I decided I was going to um, stop complaining. So I picked a day and, and literally it was like one day and I'm going to not complain at all today. And so I had an orchestra rehearsal that day and, and a concert and I got to the rehearsal and in an orchestra, the violins, we, we sit together, two people sit together on one music stand reading the same music. And I saw who I was sitting with and my immediate reaction was, oh no, she wasn't the strongest performer. And so it's hard to sit next to somebody who's uh, struggling a little, <laughs> okay? It's really hard to do uh, for me. Uh, other people, maybe it's not. Um, and so, but I saw that and I, and in my mind, I literally went like this, oh no, I picked today is the day I can't complain. And I wanted to complain. But I said, no, I am going to stay with my commitment. And I'm so glad I did because what I learned from that day and that re first rehearsal was that my complaining was what was causing my misery. Mm -hmm. I had a ball sitting next to her. I had so much fun. I played better. She played better. It was amazing. And, and the, was the, the pages I turned themselves. Yeah, <laughs> right. My attitude was so different. It was amazing. Yeah. And I learned so much from that commitment about being aware of my words, being aware of, of how I'm using them and how important it is to pay attention and be intentional. It made a huge difference. You know, sometimes you can make friends with that which irritates you. Yep. You or really the person who irritates you. Sometimes you you can make friends with them. It's almost like there's a a, a grumpy old man or woman in everybody. <laughs> so Absolutely. you gotta make make friends with them. And I remember as a hospice volunteer, I I would go in and and um, I would just make friends with whoever they are. I was like, I can't believe they're handling you so well. They like like beat up their roommate last night. I was like, no, ah, she's so sweet. How would she ever? right so it's it's interesting you can make friends and then they you know there's no way they would um do that to you mm -hmm. right and Absolutely. It, it's uh because I, I think there's a that meaning of the souls that can happen oh yeah and yeah and it's interesting because uh i the hawaiian concept is when things are going on that um if you can clean it within yourself it also cleans it in the world and so I really, at that point, I was praying for her and I didn't confront her and say, you know, she's so nice to me. Why did you do that to your roommate? Because, I mean, she had dementia. She's kind of had in that flip out space of it. And I just said, said, was talking to her soul. And I just said, you know, but you, you can be gentle and be nice with your roommate. You know, I was kind of doing my little energy thing. And um, they, I said, well, I went back the next week. And they, they said, you know, she didn't do that to her roommate all this past week. And I was like, yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> so trying to help other people deal with their difficult people. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's, I don't want to take all the credit, but it, it just made me feel good that maybe, maybe uh, there was a shift in, in helping other people deal with their difficult people. Yeah, that's beautiful. Isn't it amazing how something like that can happen? Yeah, that was great. I loved it. <laughs> so, so I know, and in terms of, um, you know, you you were giving the example of the sister and the, the mean stuff that was that was going on. What are some other things that you think would be good for people, not just in that scenario, but in other scenarios, for them to apply to dealing with the difficult people that they that either live with them or don't live with them or around them? What, yeah. what would you suggest? Now, what if it's your boss? Oh, there you go. Right. What if it's your Usually, boss? Yeah, I had, people. again, so many coaching clients more recently whose boss is narcissistic, controlling, um, micromanaging. And this is hard for people. You know, I'm, and some people have the luxury of being able to simply quit because the energy is so bad. I'm just done. Right. You know, and it is important that we pay attention to our energy, 
Um, but what if we're in a situation where we don't have that luxury where we can quit? What do we do? How can we go to work and not get dragged down to the depths, feeling incompetent, worried that we're going to get fired um, for whatever reason, or just feeling so tired of being beaten down? What can we do? And for me, the solution I've shared with people that seems to help is really an energetic one. You know, um, because we know we cannot, we cannot go to our boss and say, hey, you know, you're acting like a jerk today. It's really irritating me and I'm feeling badly. That's not going to happen. It's you know, not going to play well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and you can't really go to HR and report them if there is an HR because retaliation. I mean, there's a lot of, it's fear stuff happening there. And if you need your job and there's nothing on the horizon, what do we do? So the first thing I tell people to do is make that energy bubble, make the bubble around them. And people who are not necessarily in my metaphysical field or <laughs> spiritual field, sometimes they're like, oh, okay, this is weird. And I'm like, just try it. I'm telling you. And so I will explain to them, you know, to breathe in the love, et cetera, which again, we're in that woo-woo state for some people. But when people are desperate, they will try this stuff. Um, and the rest of us who are all watching and listening, who are used to these things are going, yeah, no problem. Um, <laughs> so Great. breathe in the love, feel it in your body, Expand it, expand it, expand it, expand it, expand it, make it a big bubble. Then I tell them to set an intention. And I always do my arms around me like this, like this is my boundary, right? You know, and say today only positive, wonderful energy is going to enter my energy field. Only love and light will come in, whatever you want to say, but something using positive words of only love and light, only positive energies will enter my energy field today. This does a couple things. One, it gets us in our love and light. We feel more protected. And so our energy is putting off a more positive energy because you know how sometimes, you know, those bosses, they know who the weak ones are. And if you're feeling badly, you are now labeled weak in quotes, right? And so they're going to, you know, it's bully right in on you. So you'll be more confident in yourself. Now, this isn't going to magically work like the, you know, all the time necessarily, but it certainly can help. It gets our mind in a better space. We do feel better and we may notice some changes there. Another way, and again, woo-woo still, because that's what energy work is, even though it's not, um, <laughs> is, and I had a student teacher once who's, um, uh, what do they call him? The, the teacher who watched them, the college professor who watched them came and observed. I can't think of the term, but he was getting on her for lots of stuff. And rightfully, <laughs> I was getting on her as well, but in a different way. Um, but she was feeling really attacked by him. And I said, what if you just sent him like really positive energy? You know, not with a manipulation behind it of I want him to treat me better, but I'm sending him positive energy so that he has a good day. I send him positive energy so that he feels happier. I send him that love, basically sending him the love and light, but without the manipulation behind it, the ulterior motive, right. okay, a purity of heart. And we started drawing little hearts with legs all over the place on everything on her papers and stuff. It actually worked for her and things got better. So these two energetic things can help. Now, at the same time, I know people will say this stuff, that's not going to help. It's not going to do anything because we think we have to do something on a physical verbal level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a situation like this, we probably can't. And so if we feel like we can't do that, we feel helpless. We feel powerless. Okay, I can't do anything about this. And when we're in that helpless, powerless state, we're miserable. And we move into that bad sense of I give up, the bad sense of give up, where it just drains everything. Doing something energetically rebuilds our own energy and mm -hmm. gets us back into our power so that we can handle it better. And while we're doing that, we can be Googling and looking for a different job, right? <laughs> you know, so we can do that. 
but it really makes a difference because we are mindset is in a different space <laughs> and that can help. <laughs> I think that, I think that's an excellent point that having the right mental space about it it's it's hard when people feel like they're under the gun and it, it might uh, be reminiscent of, of of a parent or other person of authority over them a teacher or whoever and it's it's bringing the, that to the forefront of old regression response to what's going on but I I think energetically if you can shift and go say, okay, this person's probably micromanaging because they're being told if they don't, mm -hmm. then, I mean, so they actually think that it's their job to do this, to make sure because they feel under the gun themselves. And if you, I've noticed that if, if you do that, you just say, no, you, you've got an amazing um, sense of attention to the detail. And I, I really appreciate that about you. And and I'm glad that you're learning to trust me that I'm handling it because I've, I've been able to do th these particular uh, pieces or projects or whatever and in this particular way. And I'm I'm glad you're able to refocus your energies because uh, what your job, what you, your job is very important. And I, I know it's a relief to you to not have to do that for me. Nice. What do you think? <laughs> Right. I love it. I love it. And it's a polite way of dealing, I think. With yeah. Them. And it, and it, you don't have to do, you don't have to say that over and over again to the, the uh, boss person, but this just that sense of it, it can ease the way so that they go, Hey, this person kind of gets what I, I am having my own struggle with. Yeah. With yeah. It's like, it, and sometimes too, it does work to kind of stoke their ego a little bit, you know? And Yeah. It, and it's, I don't think of it as fawning. I think way. it's you having that sense of um, compassion about what, the level of authority that they have to take on Yeah, uh, to, to manage uh, with things. But I don't know if you've ever heard of the Peter principle. Uh, I have, but, but remind me. <laughs> yeah. So there is a, a, a man um, who... He wrote the book, Peter Principle, his last name's Peter. Uh, but he he observed that uh, when it came to people who were bosses, that not everybody excelled in managing people, yeah. that they had been even put into that position because they were good at such and such. And he gave the example of he he loved his auto mechanic, the 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 company. He would always trust this one auto mechanic that was at, at this company he would take his car to. Well, the company really knew that this is an outstanding employee auto mechanic and they put him into a manager position and eh, wrong thing <laughs> because he's not good at managing people he's good at fixing your car and so so sometimes that's what's happened is that people because they think promotions are a good thing is that necessarily the right thing because it's a totally different set of skills that's needed it'd be nice if they understand about the auto mechanic stuff that they have to do so they can have compassion about what they're handling and be able to talk to customers, blah, 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 whatever it is. But if you're not a good manager, it's not going to flow well. So sometimes what's happened is they've been, they, by a society thought of promotion or, or uh, just, they've been put into that position that's inappropriate for their skill set. Yeah. So we have to be compassionate about that too. Right. And they might be feeling really insecure and thinking they have to act this way because that's what they're supposed to do in quotes. And that can be really hard for them. Well, don't you, didn't you see, notice that in the teaching profession for, to some extent, like you get through new crop of kids and you're kind of like, I gotta be a little bit heavy in the first few days for them to know what the rules are. That's and what they maybe, told us. Right. They say, do that. Right. And, and then yeah. you can lighten it up and be, you know, nicer as time goes on. If, if they're good. Right. And they follow the rules. And all so that. There, there, there's a society thing, too. And so the manager person is sometimes waiting for all the kids to be good. And uh, we ran into the situation with our, our younger son at one point where um, one of the what a boy would be misbehaving in the class. And so that meant the whole class couldn't go out for recess. Yeah. So a whole group can be punished because of one person's actions. And that's incorrect, too. So. Yeah, so sometimes you have this, the fairness issues that are going on when you're dealing with difficult people 
And you say, but that's not fair. That's not fair. So what do you do when you like, it's truly not fair. Right. When it's truly not fair. Right. And, and it is important to stay in the power of course, but also recognize if we get stuck in that story, uh, you know, repeating the story again, where we're the victim. If we start the victim stuff again, we're out of our power. So much can be, um, improved. I'm not going to say totally solved, but improved by being in our power, mm -hmm. you know, because we can recognize that. And also let's just be factual. Life is not always fair. Stuff. There we go. Happens, you I know? know, and yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and, you know, I just was reading this article the other day. I couldn't believe it. Do you know, in New York state, that if somebody squats in your house for longer than three days, 30 days, they have more rights than you do. And that you, to get them out, have to do an eviction proceeding. And that there is a couple who bought a house and they are in their second year trying to get the squatter out. So that law needs to be changed. So that is oh, my, right? totally I, not fair. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw this art. And I thought, well, why? Like, what's wrong? Yeah, How do you deal with that difficult person? Right. Come on, Colleen, fix that. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, you know, you know what I would do. <laughs> I contact my son and have him go find some friends um, <laughs> and take care of it that way. Um, Colleen has right? her own mafia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyway, right? So what do you do? Yeah. These people are going through the legal system, spending thousands and thousands of dollars Poor to people. move into the house that they bought and have not yet lived in. Okay, that's pretty unfair. It's not fair. Okay, so yeah. for the in that case, I'm definitely I I would be irritated. I am not going to be all lovey joy here, you know. So no, let's woo woo send energy. Yeah, I probably would just <laughs> because it's the only thing you could do, really. You know, you, that... yeah. Sometimes the only thing you can do is send love and light because the other stuff doesn't help. Yep, it just keeps the brewing and the stewing, but. You know, one would hope that that would shift out of it. Yeah. I mean, some, some people are dealing with that or worse in their exactly. life right now. Right. And so when, when things like this are happening, our focus, what we're looking at, we have to be careful as to the best we can to not get so caught up in what's wrong that we miss the rest of what's right. Mm -hmm. oh, so we want to get back into some gratitude for what is right. And it when we have big stuff going on, it, it affects everything until we get to a certain point. And it can take time to get there. And so we've got to be reasonable. You know, this is not a, oh, I'm upset. I'm not immediately going to move into this. We can recognize that it's going to take time and we might be in survival mode. And that's okay. It's okay to be in survival mode. And recognize that we are upset and rightfully so. And eventually, once we've gotten past some of the worst of it, we might be able to step back and a little bit. And for our own mental health, we have to focus on what is good as well and kind of compartmentalize really is what it yeah, is. I, I think that's a, a good point. It's because if you let that be the majority of what's happening in your life, in your own mental story of of your life, then it will grind you down. You, yeah. you'll be ground down to smithereens kind of thing. So it does uh, behoove a person to say, this is not all there is. I will move into a state of quieting about this. And I will just be in that survival mode of mindfulness of, I am now getting a plate out of the cupboard and putting it on the counter. I am getting a fork out of the drawer and putting it on the counter I am preparing my food and I'm putting like just like sometimes you have to stop yourself through those things in order to deal with a difficult situation and difficult people in your life and so that you can stay as centered as you can in, in those mundane tasks so I, I think there there is a place for that unfortunately there, there is a, yeah I mean people have some tough stuff like now I mean people are, there are so many people who are struggling with things it seems to be so much more than I was ever aware of in the past you know and to get into that mindfulness place sometimes I tell myself if I like get caught in my head a lot in this moment everything is perfect 
yes. you know, because it takes me back to the present moment and gets me out of my head. And you know, the other valuable thing about that is that if you're in that, that sacred space, that sacred mindset space of awareness, then you're going to be more receptive to receiving intuitive guidance. You're more receptive to the voice of God and the acts of God that are in your life of people who show up as angels in your life. All of a sudden, they will advocate for you in a circumstance or uh, they'll show up and they have brought you a meal. So sometimes dealing with the difficult situations or people in our life, it's an opportunity for us to go back into that intuitive guidance. And it's hard to go relax when you're not feeling it, but like get yourself into that gratitude space. It really helps. And then you can, you'll have the intuitive guidance of what you could say or what you could do that would help to heal a situation or move it forward in a positive way. So yeah, never underestimate that guys. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so important. You yes. know? And the, the, that sense of, um, in some ways it is, you know, it's the idea of people are like, Oh, like you were saying, if, how, how can you relax if you're not in that space? Like people say, well, just meditate. I don't know about you, but when my mind is going all over the place, the last thing I'm going to be able to do is sit down and go, Oh, let's get centered. It just doesn't happen for me. And yeah. so that's yeah. when I might go do something else, mm -hmm. you know, distract myself, do something creative, go for a walk. Mm -hmm. And this gets us into that same similar space where there's some stillness will come in. And once that stillness is there, that's where, that's when the guidance will come. And they then call that the still point when you're actually there. Yeah. And you can, you can achieve that if you're doing some sort of work or walking. And I think it also is really important to note that uh, those happy molecules, when people move their body, the muscles uh, will activate and it, it's much better than you just laying there and vegging out on the couch, just kind of zombieing. If you can get up and move your muscles, it tells your body, I'm engaging with this. And you'll be better able to meet uh, those difficult people in your life. Now, I know uh, we're, we're getting close on time here, but I, I know one of the things that you and I had talked about before was what if you've decided that that difficult person needs to be completely expelled from the yes. life? Let's let's lean into that one. Absolutely, because that is so important too. And many people experiencing this, the family estrangements, um, whether you're on the receiving end of being estranged or you're estranging. I'm not sure that's, mm -hmm. you know, how grammatically yeah. is correct, but you get the point. Right. <laughs> right. right. So what do we do in that case? Um, and here's the thing. If you're the person that has decided somebody can't be in your life, I'm assuming first you've tried to Fix it as best you can without sacrificing yourself or your power or putting up with abuse. Now, if you have been abused, et cetera, and you need to separate from that person, it's essential that you recognize how uh, protecting your, your power, protecting your energy, and it's okay to do. Now, the other thing, if what if you're on the receiving end and somebody is not speaking to you and you've tried to figure out or help or whatever, and it's still not working this, I, so many, I've had so many people tell me this in the last couple of years, you know, their kids aren't speaking to them, their mother's not speaking to them, whatever it is. And the way that I've handled this in my own situation is to recognize that my child is on his own path. It's his path, and this is part of his soul growth. I can't fix something that is not mine to fix. And I saw um, in a Facebook group somewhere where this person was claiming that every time a child, uh, adult child, wasn't speaking to the parent, it was the parent's fault that they obviously did something wrong. And 100% of the time, hmm. right? Hmm. And the people in this group were not in agreement either. Hmm. And I said, yeah. that doesn't make sense because, you know, we can have the greatest parents in the world and we still have kids who go out there and, and do horrible things, you know, and it's not the parents fault and it's not 
one of my pet peeves is, oh, your parents must be so proud. They raised you so well. I'm like, hmm, that also means if you did something wrong, the parents had a problem. It's the same thing. That's one of my pet peeves. And so I'm it, for my situation, I'm recognizing it's somebody else's path. That's They need to figure it out for themselves. They need to learn. And that helped me step back and not get all caught up in, oh no, this is horrible, what can I do? And I know it's worked for some other people that I know who are experiencing something similar where somebody in their family is not speaking to them and they love them very much and want to be in their lives. And this is hard. And it's particularly hard if you're a parent and your kid's not speaking to you. And I know four situations right off the top of my head where this is happening. And the parents, to the best of my knowledge, are really wonderful people, very loving and love their kids and did everything for them. And it could be very easy for these parents to go into that victim mode or go into the self-judgment. What did I do wrong? I did something wrong. Yes, because we are supposed to self-assess. We are supposed to do that. I mean, it's an important thing for us to do. Yep. We just can't lock into that and let that be the only stage of things. Yeah. And if we look at it and we go, I did something wrong, then we do the best we can to fix it. Right. And then it's the other person's right to accept it or not accept your apology or effort or whatever. Right. So to handle that is to rec it really is important to recognize that their path is theirs, your path is yours, and trust that. Right. It, and it doesn't, it's not going to totally remove any sadness or grief or pain, but it really can yeah. help. Mm -hmm. It really can. And again, go back to sending them the loving hearts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the other part of that is uh, stop obsessing. Um, stop getting yourself into a worry frame of mind. You want to move into that faith prayer standpoint instead of the fearful yeah. Uh, mode of things and uh, sometimes you just have to give give it all to god as it were but it, you know you have to honor if somebody says i don't want contact you have to honor that um uh, and you you just have to know that even when you think about them don't send it out as a thought with a grappling hook of energy yes. it has to not have the energy hook at the end you know, no manipulation. People can feel that. People can feel it if, um, if people are thinking about them. If you're sensitive, you don't have to touch it. But so, so uh, just know that it's a soft touch thinking. That's how I would explain that to folks. It's like a soft touch uh, that that is uh, just sending pure love, the highest and best good, envisioning them as a spark of the divine, and that is such a relief to us then. Yeah. It's such a relief that we can do something, but we, we can't do the hook. We can't do any of those things. We have to leave go. Yeah. And this is big. If people can do that, you know, and again, it's to the best of our abilities, yeah. you know, I mean, the back of our mind, we're always thinking, well, if I send this, then maybe they'll come around. And we can recognize it's still there in the back of our mind, but we do our best to be as authentic, genuine, and pure in that sending. Mm -hmm. And that it makes a difference. It really does. And, and I will say that sometimes uh, reconciliation is not always about talking it all out. If reconciliation right. happens with a difficult person, it doesn't mean that everything will get nuanced out the way you think it should be parsed. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily happen that way. And anybody who's been in any kind of relationship knows there's a give and a take. And especially a long term, let's say marriage. Marriage is one of those things where you're in that forgiveness state with them for various things. And, and that there's support that can happen along the way. And that's the same kind of thing that happens with, with a parent child too, right? There are forgiveness things that happen along the way. And hopefully it's strong enough to carry you through the, the darker, difficult times. But uh, certainly owning whatever is yours, not bringing it up to everybody else, not trumpeting it all around. Well, And if somebody says, well, I've heard that your son's not been talking to you for a few years. Thank you so much for your concern. And I'm actually letting myself be okay about that and honoring that relationship. 
and then you change the subject because it, it's not necessarily right to reopen about that and have those thought forms because sometimes people are in a I would say a light gossip mode does that make sense if it, like, <laughs> they care yeah. but they you know and, and it's not really going to be helpful so sometimes in the dealing of with difficult people it's dealing with the people around that situation be they other family members or other friends mm -hmm. but you're I, I you know what I'm trying to say it's almost like in the indirect people around the situation of the difficult person yeah or taking <laughs> sides right yeah. right right so. so there's the there I I know this particular topic of how to deal with difficult people we can't answer everything for all of you who are, who are listening to today, but hopefully we've given you some thoughts of how you may uh, approach this a little differently energetically and mentally, emotionally, even physically, and how to bring yourself more to a still point of, of gratitude and acceptance. Okay. I, I would say those are some bottom line things for people, right? Yeah. And love shows up in different ways. How you love other people. It shows up in all different ways and all different it forms. Really does. Any last things you'd like to share with folks before we close things up for today? No, just keep being themselves and shine their light. That's so That's important. Right. That solves so many problems. <laughs> That's right. And uh, honoring honoring where you're at, honoring where other people are, uh, are, are at, and knowing that this too shall pass, that you're learning so much from these examples of your life and do your best to love the other people. If you know, if you're dealing with a difficult person, do your best to love the other people that are around you so that it doesn't become such a central focus for you that you forget those other relationships. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Colleen. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everybody who was writing in and sharing comments and their own stories of, of difficult people. And we will send all of you love and light as you're going through that particular journey and also love and light to the difficult people. Mm -hmm. Many blessings to all of you. And I'll see you next week for another great show. I'll have Joseph Shiel, Shiel on the show. We're going to be talking about conversational mediumship. So. Nice. Another great show in store for everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.